What's up, everyone? Welcome to What the Tech Wednesday. This is our our first What the Tech Wednesday, Brian. How do you feel about that? I know it's it's good. I'm gonna start this one off with a joke because I told this earlier to our esteemed guests, and I'm an audio guy, also production guy. So I like telling this one. So why did God say let there be light? Brian? It's a good question. I don't know. Why? Because audio was already working. But um yeah, so so <laughs> today we've got uh, joining us for our uh, inaugural What the Tech Wednesday, uh, two guests uh, from QSC. We got uh, Dan Waltons and Kevin Rodas that will be joining us in just a moment to talk about some of the new exciting features, stuff that's been going on on the QSA system side of things. Uh, there has been a lot going on. Um, but before we dive into that, Brian, you obviously being our QSC QSA guru uh, at AudioBiz have been dealing with a lot of systems lately and helping with designs and things like that. Um, For some of the people that might not be familiar, I guess, do you want to walk us through on kind of what you've been seeing as of late from like system designs and and how people are incorporating different things? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So the the kind of linchpin of the system uh, recently has been the Core 110, which is our sort of all-in-one unified core. It's got analog I.O., um, you know, right on it. It's bigger brother, the 510. We see in some of these larger uh, training rooms, bigger corporations, they can even run multiple rooms, which is kind of cool. Uh, that guy takes little card slots. And then we even have a server based core. That's a, an actual Dell server that can cover an entire campus or building, right? Yeah. The, the great thing about QSC and QSIS is the flexibility of the system. So we can add on all kinds of stuff that's both within our ecosystem and outside of it. So things like our uh, QSIS cameras that are pan, tilt, zoom, you know, output right over the network cable. And the beauty is it's just a single USB connection on the other end. So we don't have to worry about extension and all that kind of stuff. And as we're viewing as- you on a QSIS camera right now, correct? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, you know, for bringing audio in, We have a ton of options. I mentioned analog before, Uh, you know, that's not going away anytime soon, but we can do Dante. We can do AES 67, you know, QSC recently acquired a Teratech. um, And that's a great way to get all of the above on board and really sits nicely into, you know, your average corporation, education, wherever that has an existing network. One of the, the really cool ones I like seeing in, in uh, a lot of the installs that we've been helping out with is the Bluetooth one. Uh, I like the Bluetooth, the Tarot Tech wall plate. It's cool to bring into to QSIS. There's a lot of functionality there. And, you know, it's cool to be able to connect wirelessly. So, yeah, that's been an absolute lifesaver, you know, in, in a lot of situations. Um, um Oh, well, there, Travis brought this up. I was just going to mention, you know, uh, we are interactive on this. So before we bring uh, Kevin and Dan in, I just want to remind everyone, if you've got questions, make sure that you uh, put those in the comment sections. We can bring those uh, on the screen here and uh, answer those questions for you. But I guess without further ado, let's bring Kevin and, and Dan on. There's Dan. Hey, good morning. Dan There's Walton, awesome. How's it going? All right. Good. Thank you guys for joining us today uh, on our inaugural What the Tech Wednesday. You know, there's a lot happening in the world of QSC right now, um, which is awesome. It's been extremely fun to sell and get in front of people with projects and everything. Um, but we wanted to bring you guys on to kind of talk to us about some of the the new things, the changes that have been going on. There's new software. There's new cores. There's just, frankly, a lot to talk about. So. I guess we wanted to start off with version 9.0 just recently dropped. Uh, so you want to give us kind of like some of the key things that you guys are super excited about in version 9 software. Sure. I can lead off with some of that. I mean, right away for sure was uh, the announcement of some of the new hardware that we're, that we're doing in there. So, you know, uh, earlier up above there, Brian was talking about uh, at the beginning of it, talking about the core 110, the core 510, all that. We, we've got... Uh, Three, three new core options out there. The Core 8 Flex, which is going to be, uh, uh, is one. There's some new speakers in the line. We're also Teams and Zoom certified. Um, and we've got some more stuff uh, now that has software-based Dante in it and things like that. We're also going to talk a little bit today about 
uh, CSS and how much more robust that we're trying to get that piece into there. And it was all part of nine. Um, we also want to discuss a little bit about uh, QSIS Reflect. So that's our cloud management and enterprise management solution there. And then finally, we'll uh, end up today with uh, some of the USB routing options for human interface devices. So a lot of stuff, uh, plus the, some training and things that we offer up. So that's kind of where we're at, where we're at uh, on the big overview there. So uh, cool. I think, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, if you haven't downloaded version version nine yet, uh, make sure you do that. Get that on, on your machines and start uh, testing. That is available now to download from the the QSU website. So, yep. just want to remind everyone. Yep. Yeah, it, it definitely it, it's our largest release probably since version one. So there's just tons and tons of stuff in there. Um, yeah, so circling back toward the cores you were mentioning, Dan, um, yeah. you know, those smaller cores are really going to help us fill a niche because some of the pushback we occasionally get is I don't need a 110, much less a 510, you know, or, right. or the server. Um, can you guys just kind of run us through some of the new options um, that were just announced and are now in the software so we can kind of play around with them virtually? Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about them for the last few months, uh, but now 9.0 brings those devices into uh, where you can actually design with them. They're, these items are available to be ordered up. But the first two, you know, we're excited about the two small form factor. First thing when you look at them, they're the standard half rack U stuff that we normally have. Um, comes with all the mounting hardware. I mean, I, I, I'll say it, but uh, it should go without saying. Uh, and then they can be racked together. They can be paired up with our amps, our NV32, whatever the case may be there. But the one on the left there, if you guys are taking a look at the screen, is 4Nano. So this box has really no uh, analog I.O. on it, but it does have two RS-232 ports, fully bidirectional uh, for remote control of other devices. And then you'll notice that we also have USB-C connection and a USB-B connection. Those are both going to be able to provide that bridging and conferencing. So when you're pairing up those QSIS cameras with this, this is a really nice fit. So uh, the idea here is that uh, we're just kind of future proof and we know that there's going to be features on USB-C down the road. It's an either or. Um, so it's not that you're getting two bridges on there, but something to be aware of. Dual LAN ports like uh, like the other uh, uses peripherals that we have. Um, also, the USB-A offers some features with the HID routing and stuff. Stuff we'll cover later on there. Um, but the great price point in that, great dealer entry price point and, and be able to pass on in that. And then the, the eight flex, very similarly loaded to that. The difference there is we give you eight of our flex channels. If you're not familiar with the flex channels from the core 110 or the IO8 flex box, these, are, these can be configured uh, one in, seven out, two in, six out, however you want to do it. If you want one, three, and five to be your inputs, and two, four, and six to be your outputs, whatever the case, works great with that. Also, we added some GPI and some GPO on there as well. So the idea that um, you're going to have microphones in the system or whatever. Both of these cores uh, come with uh, 8x8 software Dante. They'll both support eight channels of uh, echo canceling, um, <clears throat> and they'll do a uh, 64 by 64 network audio channels in there. So, yeah, um, and so, then oh, oh, go ahead. I said to round those out is uh, now the ability to run the NV32H as a core. So. Yep. What we can do now with the NV32 is instead of being a streaming encoder or decoder, it becomes a local 3 by 2 HDMI switcher, but I gain all the same software audio processing that those Nano and 8 Flex have. So now um, if I have a very, you know, I have a room like Brian's in right there where I've got, a you know, just some local couple of sources, single display, I can throw an NV32 in and run my whole room off that single one device. So... Um, it opens up a lot of possibilities for that product, and it's it's the same product I order. I order a core capable NV. It could be a stream, it could be an encoder, it could be a decoder, or it could be a core, um, all out of the box. That's so. I guess I want to mention. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I just want to clarify. You know, just uh, you, you're mentioning core capable NV32. So yep. there was a distinguishing of of there was an actual change in hardware. Um, from the original NV32s. So keep that in mind if you are looking at um, using the encoder or the core capabilities yep. of it. It's got to be the new new hardware. So yeah, looks like we got a question from Daniel. So NV32 in core mode, can encode and decode at the same time in nine? I, I mean, so, the way you, go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. To, 
Um, yeah, so it it does not encode or decode. It's really just a three by two switcher at that point. So I can use the three local HDMI ins and matrix them out to any of the two outputs. Um, I still get the graphics still store and everything, but you you trade being able to do streaming for being able to actually do core audio processing. Yeah. And the other thing too is same thing with the when when a decoder box when you configure it to be four if you do 4K it's only going to do a single 4K out that three by two is you get the two output when you go to 1080P you know it's just a matter of resources or something to be aware of. Also, it doesn't ship with the the included eight by eight software they based Dante because we don't know if you're gonna use it as a, an encoder or decoder, or you're gonna actually switch it into core mode. So just another thing to kind of touch base on. Yeah, it does really simplify. I mean, we've been seeing that with a couple of dealers that are really excited about it because they've been doing these local rooms where it's you know just like a huddle space, like Kevin was saying with Brian's room of just some local sources. And before it was, okay, add a matrix switcher from somebody else, write the plug in to control it. Now it's all just really drag and drop uh, with the the system and it's so easy even i can do it <laughs> um, with, with getting it set up in the control the other thing that seems to be really cool with the um you know especially with like the nano is really the use of the you know kind of tying in the whole aterotech idea of i've got all this distributed digital io that might be throughout the space I've got microphones that are talking digitally. I've got, you know, IO wall plates, um, you know, so it's nice because we have seen that a lot where people are doing distributed audio uh, or distributed sources, I guess I should say, on core 110s and not really using any of the, you know, built in IO. So it kind of answers that, hey, is there something something smaller, which is which is pretty cool. So. Yeah, we, we've had a lot of interest in it. It's provided a lot of, you know, static. And the idea, too, is, you know, we, we talk a lot about audio, but it's a control processor, too. So maybe we don't need to, maybe we need to go into a situation where we don't need any to process any audio or very little, right? And we can do that with a few Atero devices. But for, you know, you're bringing in a, a control engine right there. So that's another great feature. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, in that, conversation we just had a Dante came up a couple times right so we kind of uh, really pioneered software based Dante inside of a DSP um, during the year that we won't mention um, but now <laughs> with version 9 we've kind of expanded that out uh, a bit right so can you guys like touch on that what's what's new in the world of software Dante stuff yeah so well, now all the cores support software Dante so um, like we said, everything except the NV32 ships now with an 8x8 license included, and then you can expand it up. So the Nano, 8 Flex, NV32, they can all go up to 32 by 32 Dante, uh, as, as well as the 110. Um, and but now it comes into the bigger course too. So the 510, I can do 128 by 128 software Dante, and the 5200, I can do 512 by 512. So in a single DSP, I can do you know. 512 by 512, which is just unheard of. Um, and one of the really nice things, um, if you've integrated in the past and maybe use AS67 from a device or something, is now the core can be the clock master for both Dante and QAN. So it really cleans up a lot of installations. Um, and it really provides you know a lot more flexibility and power on all these systems. So I guess with the 510, you know, what... What's the advantage uh, of using the software Dante versus like the existing, you know, hardware card? Yeah. So uh, like I hinted at a little, well, it, it comes down to like clock planning a lot is um, if I, if I need to run Dante in a separate clocking world, I can put a hardware card in and do that. Um, and those hardware cards don't count against my network IO channels. So I could actually throw two Dante Car, physical cards and software Dante and do 256 by 256 on that 510, but I still also have the ability to run some separate clocking networks. Uh, if everything's running in the same room, I can just throw software Dante in and not have to put a card in, um, which especially when we look at redundancy, um, that might be a lot more cost-effective solution. Maybe I'm only using 64 by 64, and so I only pay for the channels that I'm using uh, on that Dante license 
um, and I don't have to put two cards in my redundant cores. Cool. And it also uh, really just... simplifies control of Dante devices as well. Um, yeah. I'll say when you're working with a, a card-based system, you have to tie that Dante network card into the control side on the QSIS, whereas if you're just running software Dante, that can just be a single NIC port that's handing the whole shebang on there. Yep. Yep. We did have another question from uh, Joshua uh, on the NV32 in core mode. Uh, you know, can the encode and decode be changed, uh, or actually not on core mode, but I guess on the NV32, can encoding and decoding be changed through scripting to allow rooms to be as flexible as an overflow or a broadcast room? So they can't be changed with scripting, but like they can be changed with dynamic parents. <laughs> so... Uh, you can use dynamic pairing, and you'd have to move what network jack it plugs into, but based off where I get in, uh, it would become an encoder or a decoder. Yep, excellent. Cool. And there's Perfect. a great video that explains uh, dynamic pairing uh, a bit. Uh, I'd invite everybody to watch if you're curious about it. It's a little, little heady to get into right now, but it's one of the unsung cool features of QSYS. Most yeah, and, the, and in that video, they show, like, you know, different rooms, but we've also used it as, like, backup equipment and things like that. So there's, it's the, it's a great feature, but like I said, it's a little too heady to dive into on this format. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Um, another big kind of update in nine was uh, team certification and, you know, in Zoom certification, we're, we're getting all of these tie-ins with Zoom rooms, team rooms, things like that. So you want to go into a little bit of, you know, kind of what that all is and, and why that's, uh, you know, hey, well, it's pretty, pretty big uh, announcement. So I guess let's dive into that a little bit. Yeah. So one of the really big things with it is, um, you know, we had previously announced this fall or last fall that the Core 110 was team certified, um, that, you know, a, a, a whole, we have a, multiple package solutions for teams that fit all sorts of different spaces. Um, 9 Nevada unlocked two really big things for teams. The first was the USB I.O. bridge. So now we can use the USB I.O. bridge. I can centralize my core. You know, I could run multiple rooms off my 110 that's certified. Um, and so the USB I.O. bridge is certified. But the other big thing is uh, a piece of software we have now called QSIS Control for MTR. And what that allows is now we can bring sort of the missing piece we had was bring control into these Teams room scenarios. So I load up a piece of software on the Teams room console, and now I can load a UCI onto it. So I can run my whole room. I can do all my QSIS control and be able to, you know, look at, and this will work on any, it'll work on a Logitech tap, it'll work on a Lenovo Smart Hub, whatever. Uh, Microsoft Teams room compute you're using, uh, but I can have QSIS control right there, and I can do, you know, it's it's same UCI viewer, I can do everything else, so I can do camera previews, I can do pages, I can do layers, any type of control I can think of, I can put on there, and I have one piece of glass in the room that I can control everything from. Yeah, that's really yeah, important. We've, 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 yeah, that's a great, great feature for sure. Um, you know, one of the other things that, uh, you know, is kind of tied in there, you, you also have, you know, with it being integrated so much with teams and even the zoom room stuff is you've got some things like, you know, the mute sync capabilities, you know, by these all being certified, you're also turning off, um, the, you know, the onboard processing of these devices and the software echo cancellation and things like that, and giving it, you know, definitely more power, um, by running exactly. through the, through the DSP. So. And, and that's one of the things people don't understand about the certification in some of these platforms is it allows for us to be able to, you know, in a larger space with multiple microphones, we want to use the individual microphones echo canceling and not be dependent on a single echo canceler. You know, that works great if I'm using a laptop or a small room or something like that. But that's the whole point of the certification process on a lot of those. And the other nice thing too is if you, as a client, if they change their platform, you know, six months down the road, all of this stuff works, you know, it's not like you have to buy a team specific IO USB bridge or any, any of that type of stuff. So it really is agnostic uh, along the way if the if they change providers or change the path that they're headed. Uh, great. And in great addition to, 
to just changing, it also still provides the flexibility where I can now throw an IO USB bridge at the table and not only am I using, maybe I use the bridge off my Core 110 behind the display, but at the table I can throw an IO USB bridge and they can do bring your own device in a room that's already set up as a Teams room or a Zoom room. Um, but And it will still interface. So you'll still get uh, echo cancellation bypass on Teams desktop. You'll still get mute sync status and everything. Um, but they can bring in their laptop and do whatever platform they want to do in a room that, you know, typically would just be locked down to being whatever platform is in that room. So, and the fact that we can share the cameras and everything, it, it brings a lot of, a lot of really cool advantages and a lot of cool advantages to the bigger rooms, you know, with the camera bridging um, and being able to switch cameras on the fly. Um, that's something really unique. And uh, the um, 20 by 60 camera just recently got team certified. So now we can use that in large rooms. And we can switch cameras on the fly. We can multiple cameras. We could go to multiple uh, compute units. Um, it's a really, really um, unique and really time-saving and cost-saving uh, deployment we can do in some of these larger spaces that otherwise is nearly impossible or extremely cost-prohibitive. One yeah, little side visible. note on that as well. Oh, go okay. ahead, Dan. <laughs> As I say, one of the little side note on that part of the whole of the audio chain that they certify is a, the litany of different speakers in our acoustic design series as well. So if you got a mixed ceiling option where you need some pendants, you need some in ceiling, you need a uh, surface mount speakers on a wall, that whole series, you know, fits that audio path that they, that they prescribe there. So yep. One of the and first even to just do bumping that. out of the um, certification realm everything is compatible fully as well with regular teams, regular zoom, you know, 90% of the streaming platforms out there. And, and one of the things I like to point out because more, more and more now we're seeing these spaces where it's three divisible rooms and then it might be two one day and all three and one and one and one. If we just have that single USB endpoint from us in each of those rooms, we can intelligently using a single core behind the scenes route all three cameras to their individual spaces or let room one borrow room threes when it's all wide open. It's just because we run on the network and it's all just software based processing. We have a huge advantage over a lot of these other systems where you'd have to set up a camera matrix and a USB matrix and all this other jazz to get it all to work at the end of the day. Yeah. It's something that I say all the time, Brian, as well is that, you know, people look at that, that ethernet cable coming out of the IO USB bridge or whatever. And like, Oh, so you're extending the USB with category. It's like, no, 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 we're not extending it over category. Yeah. It's a true Ethernet packet, lives on the network, lives on the switch, you know, and that, that, like you said, that's the beautiful part of it. So once your laptop can makes that USB connection to the IO USB bridge or any of the other bridging connections, you've got a nice host connection there. We're just telling which stream we want to bring in. And so therefore any of the cameras are on the network, just great. So, absolutely. And it's seamless too, you know, like when you are yeah, switching between yeah. those cameras, there's not any like dropouts or anything like that, which is really functional, you know, in these, a lot of these spaces that used to have these kind of elaborate, you know, video switching, you know, for getting different cameras and a lot more kludginess. So, yeah. And especially in traditional where um, maybe I just have a USB switcher and I'm going between two different computers Every time I switch that or switch cameras with a USB switcher, it's going to start and stop my video. Sometimes, uh, like, if, if somebody's still on Skype for business, you know, that would actually pause your meetings and everything. It's, it's very, very interruptive. And so for us, it's a seamless switch. The computer never sees that camera get disconnected or reconnected. So um, it just brings a lot of uh, simplicity to doing these multi-camera or multi-computer systems with video. And I, and I know probably most people are familiar with the camera, but once again, that page two experience, uh, either on Zoom or on, on Teams or whatever, you've got the preview windows for the camera. So you're doing multiple. You want to know where that's at. You know, you get that one second scrape back to your touch panel as well. So, you know, just a lot that's of great perfect. things with the camera. I think we could do a whole show on the cameras alone. Yeah, so. I was going to say that's a perfect lead in for this question from Daniel, <laughs> um, you know, about, uh, you know, are there any plans for adding the ability to run live video feeds on UCI screens? Um, you know, he, he mentioned he already understands that the, you know, the, the screen scrape of the, the camera every one second. Yeah. Yeah, I would say uh, stay tuned this summer. 
<laughs> there you go. Gotcha. <laughs> that's that's the best. Always looking for those nuggets. I yep. also do have to say, like, I think there needs to be etiquette for meetings like these of you know knowing when to talk. Like, I think we should have like you know like wave the yellow flag when you want to talk or something. I don't know, <laughs> but we need to figure that out. You know, it will solve the world's problems with Zoom meetings. So. <laughs> Um, speaking of kind of like uh, UCIs, um, you know, there is a big update with using CSS for uh, UCI control. Um, so it looks like we got the, we look, got Greg. He's interested in, in the CSS. So um, <laughs> you, always, you, you kind of want to give us a, a little bit of an explanation. I think we've actually got the ability to show some stuff with the CSS and kind of go into like what the power of CSS really brings to those, those UCI screens. Yeah, so um, there's a couple big things in 9. The biggest one, though, is CSS is now supported on the web UCIs. So now CSS is supported across all the UCIs. I can use it whether I'm using um, an iOS device, whether I'm using one of our touch panels, UCI viewer on a PC, doing it through the web. Regardless, wherever I'm doing it from, I can see CSS. And what CSS really boils down to is it's a quick and easy way to apply styling to my UCI. So I've got a UCI over here. It looks like I just dragged a bunch of buttons right on the screen and everything. And by simply applying a style, it now it inherits all those properties of so color and shape and images on buttons and everything. And so it's a quick and easy way, not only to apply the styling once, but I can mass apply this. So. This is from our team sample design, and you can see I can very quickly and easily make my UCI start looking like a, you know, it fits in on my team. So this is, I just dragged everything right on, and the minute I apply that style sheet to it, you know, everything got styled. It loads custom fonts now, so we now support that with 9.0. Um, it's just a really quick and easy way, and once you really start diving into it, um, I found it takes exactly the same amount of time to write a CSS style as it does normally styling my UCI. And now I have that style I can reuse. So if I'm working on a job and I got 15 rooms, I spend the time once to create that style. And now I apply it in all my different rooms and I just, you know, eliminated my design time dramatically. Yeah. And the one thing I just want to mention is CSS. When you just say it sounds really intimidating. Because if anybody's ever done like a inspect element, you know, on like a web page, or if you know what it looks like, there's a lot going on. But in reality, we're only using a fraction of that. And, you know, Kevin and the rest of the folks at QSC have written some really great sample files. There's always good info in the help. If you're a QSIS user and you're not tapping F1 to look at stuff, you're really yeah. missing out because the, the help file is really amazing. But just to get started on something, it's as easy as just taking a button and just assigning an on color uh, and then an off color and maybe how much you want to round the corners. And that might be it. Your CSS file might be this big. Yep. But now at least all of your starting buttons are going to be the same, the same color and the same style. And that's a huge time saver. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done CSS sheets that solely just change the default text color, text size and font and, you know. Um, and, and you can do it that simple. You don't have to have super complex CSS files. I've done a lot where I make, there's things called classes that you apply in CSS. And I just make very basic ones. I make, this is a round button. This is a red button. You know, I do all those. And then in designer, I just check which classes this button belongs to. So now if I want to make it a round red button with a TV image, I just choose those options and it applies everything. Um, and what's nice is I go change that once in my text file and every button will update. So if I've got all my buttons and say the customer comes back and I hate these round buttons, I want them square. Instead of having to click on every button and change back to a square button and do this, I change one line of code in my CSS and every button updates in my project and in every other project I have using that. So it's very, very quick and easy to deploy. So shout out to Dustin, uh, you know, are there going to be any templates released for CSS? Do you think that's going to be something in the future? Yeah, yeah there are some in the work and there is uh, this team sample design here. It's included as part of the file when you download it, but you can also download just the CSS style off asset manager. So 
um, that's out there today. And then um, I know there are some more in the works to have all sorts of different examples and everything. One thing on that team's design file, um, it, what you'll do is you'll go over to asset manager, go out there and you'll, that's where you'll actually install the, the team's design file. And then it'll populate up in your uh, sample files after you do that, once it downloads and you install that in the plugin. So just want to remove any confusion if someone's, you know, well, how do I find this? So. The, the CSS is kind of cool because I've, I've seen this actually at a couple different places, you know, of uh, that people change their UCI based on the season, you know, the color scheme yep. and yep. stuff like that. Uh, nothing else to do in corporate America than other than change your UCIs. But uh, it's it's super simple way to be able to, to do that with the CSS. You can just go in and make a one quick change to change color palettes and everything. And boom, you know, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. And we actually added, I believe it was eight. Four, um, it's it's definitely in there now. Um, the ability to change the CSS style on the fly. So now I don't even have to reload a design with that. I have a controller block I can bring in, so I could do it off time of day. I could tie like an ambient light sensor into my GPIO, and maybe I have you know a screening room that it's either you know there's a ton of light in or there's none, and I can dynamically change and you know basically do a day night mode on my touch panel just based off a contact closure coming in. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, super cool. yeah. And I hate to be, you know, having been on the integration side for many years, I hate to be the time saver, time saver guy, but you know, a lot of times you design very, very similar rooms. And so, yeah. but the only difference is you need red and white for, you know, the Coca-Cola boardroom you did and you need, you know, blue and yellow for whatever else you're going to do, you know, and so some of that can, you know, you can, it makes some of your code a little bit more reusable quicker as far as recoloring and styling and all of that. as well. Great feature. Oh, there, uh, Travis, Travis brought it up the blue and yellow. I was going to say that's a horrible color combination, but I guess Goodyear is doing it. So I guess uh, yeah, there you go. Goodyear. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good, going, Goodyear well, or I, the team up North. We don't talk about. Well, I, so. I was just going to say there might be some Ohio folks or, or some yeah. uh, Michigan folks. So, <laughs> Oh shoot. Yeah, we've also had some advances in how we can monitor uh, all of these systems, right? So uh, a while back, we launched Reflect, which uh, sort of allowed us to, to see in real time um, anything that was online, offline. But to say that there's been a, a big update with that is a bit of an understatement. So um, if you guys would, why don't you touch on all the really cool stuff that just popped up with Reflect? Yeah, I could start with a, with a couple of cases on that or a couple of items on that. I mean, one of the nice things is we've added the ability up in QSIS Designer to be able to click that. It'll say log into QSIS Reflect. And so then once you go to open up system designs, it's going to show you all of the ones that you have access to. So that's a nice feature there. Um, the ability to be able to push and update code to remote uh, cores is, a, is another nice feature in there as well uh, that's, that's been added along with the pro tier as well. So. Kevin, a couple yeah, other and then there. so um, and then the other major one with that is the ability to remotely view UCI. So now um, in both these scenarios, I don't have to VPN back into my network. I, I just need internet access somewhere, and I can go in through Enterprise Manager. I don't have to connect to the core. I don't have to connect to my network. In Enterprise Manager, I now have access to all those UCIs, and so I can remotely view those UCIs. I can press buttons on them. I can work through with whoever's in the room. Uh, one other thing we see a lot of people doing is, you know, once I have a UCI license on my core, I can put as many UCIs as I want. So what we've seen people do is build administrative UCIs that never show up on a actual touch panel, but rather it gives me a lot of points of monitoring that I can put up, load through, reflect, and now I can look at audio levels, I can look at, you know, gain stage throughout the system. I can give technicians who might not know QSIS Designer an ability to go in and look at a bunch of information without having to open up QSIS Designer or maybe in that case, somebody having to download it and everything. Um, so having all those UCIs there, uh, but, and, you know, I can't stress how cool it is now being able to just any core I have access to, I can connect to with Designer. So if anybody saw the um, higher ed webinar we did like last week where we talked about using Reflect and everything. Um, I had cores in that that were located in Madison. I had some cores in Costa Mesa. I had some here in Columbus with me. 
Um, and it felt exactly the same when I wrote all the files that we used for that. I saved a core and run, and it didn't matter where the core was in the world. I didn't have to have VPN. You know, I sat on the couch on my Surface and was updating cores, you know, halfway across the country. Well, that goes back to Dan's, you know, comment of save time, save time, save time, you know, of being able to manage this, you know, the the ability to monitor and even make quick changes so you don't have to roll a truck, you don't have to get into the system, you, you know. Somebody's in a room calling you saying that, you know, the UCI is not working and you can look at it and see exactly what they're doing, you know. Oh, press the other button, you know. <laughs> so And maybe you're off campus or off the network or whatever, right? Yeah. So you got a couple of, you know, what whatever. It just frees up so much time, you know, so much ability to be able to remotely access it that way and not VPN and remotely access. So great. So, for sure. So Travis behind the scenes wondering, Dan, what do you do with all your extra time? You know, <laughs> well, when it's winter time, I like to snow ski. And when it's uh, summertime, uh, I like our spring, summer and fall. I'm a, I'm a big fisherman. So oh, that's what I like. To do. I like long walks on the beach. I'm a camper. <laughs> yep. And he brings his laptop and just connects through enterprise manager to all the courses. Exactly. exactly. There you so, go. You know, looks like he's working on the yep. fishing boat, you know, so. <laughs> I do want to mention one last uh, thing um, on that, because I think anyone uh, who's involved in the IT side of things uh, just probably had a minor heart attack. But <laughs> all of these devices that we're talking about monitoring, and and this is whether they're QSIS or not. So I've got some um, sure microphones in my room, and we can monitor the status of those. But Reflect and Enterprise Manager doesn't need a connection to that. The core takes care of monitoring that. We just need a single connection to the core. And I think that's an important distinction to make um, that we are fully capable of using this monitoring solution, but we don't need to have everything on the internet seeing side of the firewall. Yeah. And, right. and not only that, but it's only an outbound internet connection the core needs. So I'm not doing any port forwarding or anything. I'm not exposing my core out to the internet to you know have everybody try and hack and everything. It's still protected behind my firewall. It just... Just the core itself needs internet access. And so that's one of the really cool things, especially with every core having at least two NICs and some of the bigger ones having even more, is I don't have to expose even expose my whole AV network. I can just plug that second NIC from my core into my internet network, and that will send all that information up to the cloud. So it's just one single connection per core we have to manage now, not hundreds of connections from all my devices out to the cloud. So. As uh, our former president would say, that's huge. Yep. <laughs> so. <laughs> hey, Mike, Mike's on, on board with Reflect. That's awesome to nice. hear. Uh, yep. It's good, good to see it's, those people out there adopting the new, yeah. all the new features. So. Yeah, it's well, the, it's it's a game changer. I mean, it and and like Brian said, it's not just QSIS devices. It anything we can monitor in scripting, you know. Or, or even if we have stuff like ping components and SNMP, we can monitor just about anything. I mean, I all, all last winter, I monitored uh, our neighborhood Christmas light show, which was about 40-some devices, uh, not a single one being QSC or even audio related, and <laughs> had it all go up to reflect, and every single thing showed up as its own on reflect and had email alerts and everything. So um, I, I do. I, I'm going to take a side tangent here because I have heard of this rumored uh, um, amazing Christmas light show. So, yeah. uh, is there videos of this? Because uh, oh yeah, I, I need to see this. So uh, yeah, have, uh, it's on the uh, it's on the QSC blog, and I will send. Uh, oh okay. I'm gonna send we'll, Travis we'll, we'll a link for it. Yeah, <laughs> I, ha- oh, yeah. I have the Lucy heard Depp rumors. Light <laughs> Yeah, all being awesome. powered by QSC, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's all monitored in the cloud and all monitored He's on the core. He's being honest because during setup, he created a Morris code, the QSIS decoder generator, <laughs> so he could oh, start yeah. the show remotely from out in the field with before the network was all the way up with just a two-way radio. And I mean. It, let me tell you, he's crazy control Kevin right yeah, now. It's uh, it's it you is like CCS. it spiraled from just some basics. I mean, it's got. You can see one of the two-way radios above me. It's got full two-way radio integration. It's got uh, you you name it. We we just kept doing more and more and more with it, and it's it's all just running off of a core one ten. 
So, so now we know uh, what Kevin does with his spare time. Uh, yes. It's, it's insane light shows. Well, uh, bet your neighbors loved it. You know, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And and that that's actually a good tangent to some of our training stuff because uh, we're one of our upcoming classes we're doing, we're, we're going to dive a little into controlling some of this stuff and how to do nice. it. So. Cool. Before I mean, we that's get all well and good, but in my house, I've got QSIS running an amplifier and a Bluetooth, a tarot tech device, and I listen to music on my back patio. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. If anybody ever wants a video, let me know. I can send that off. You know. So. <laughs> nice, nice. Yep. Some of the people uh, fishing on the lake can hear it too because I use oh, our ADS ATs. <laughs> Do you also have like the dinner bell, like ding? You know, like <laughs> I do have a barking coming. dog track that I put on an audio player for when my neighbor's dog is barking. There oh, you yeah. go. I love it. Dan Wait, has a great it. soundboard for meetings. <laughs> well, Come on, Dan. I got the price is white, you know. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> So. How come you didn't bring that to this one? I mean, come on. I, I should have. You're right. You're right. My wife's got the crickets chirping for after I tell a joke. So Nice. Okay. Well, that's, that's a good one. Uh, so sure. we, we touched on USB routing before, um, you know, that, that functionality. Any use cases that you guys are seeing that commonly used in or, you know, why that, you know, why that came about? I go back to the many, many conference rooms I've done, and you know, you know, a lot of form factors where people put a rack PC in the in the rack, and it, you know, maybe there's enterprises where people don't bring their laptops into meeting; they just go in and they log into the rack PC. You know, immediately you go out and you have to start extending that USB so that you can get keyboard, mouse, or you know, hey, maybe that rack is far enough away that uh, that you know the Bluetooth on the keyboard and mouse or whatever doesn't work. So what we if that if that uh, if that in-room PC is connected to the USB B port on the Core 110 or an NV that's in the rack or IO USB bridge, then we've got the ability then out at the table to be able to put uh, you know plug it directly a mouse and keyboard in. Also inside of QSIS, there's a USB router now as well. So I kind of have built a KVM. So if I had you know if I'm in a training environment and I and everybody's connected into an NV with their laptop. I could simply, you know, KVM and, and control different uh, computers with that and all that. So a lot of functionality. It is limited to HID. So, you know, you're not going to be plugging in uh, memory sticks or anything like that at this point. So, And the yeah, other big place we see it a lot is uh, if, like, I have an interactive touchscreen monitor in a room. Oh, and so great. now I can I have an NV decoder behind that. I plug that into there. And so now I can route that between the room PC and the laptop and whatever. Uh, whatever the device is showing on it, I can route its USB with it. So um, that's a really popular application we see for it as well. Absolutely. Now, the real question is during our level two training, Dan, do you have this set up that you can take control over everyone's computers? <laughs> it just came out in nine. Actually, there is some revamp coming on on, on level two. So we're, we're going to we'll probably have some of those features in there. We did rebuild our racks during uh, the year we don't speak of. Um, and so the level two trainings, if you haven't been to them, we're looking at a revamp in the material. We're looking at a revamp in the uh, equipment stations, including the NV stuff, the cameras, uh, some Atero tech devices, setting up AES 67 streams, all of that. So a little more robust. It's it's getting bigger. So but uh, looking for it. When is the next level two training? Well, we're hoping to get those out on the road in, in uh, late May, June, early summer. We're looking at for sure on there. So. I'm also going to throw up here, you know, there's the uh, the QSC post uh, of the blog that talks about Kevin's amazing control yeah. uh, light extravaganza. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to describe it. Light extravaganza, yes. I, I'm yeah. going to have to check this out. <laughs> yeah. Another way cool. might be fecal well, festival, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you guys mentioned um, training, online training. Uh, so you guys have yep. been doing, you, you aren't sitting idly by in the year that we don't talk about, um, but you've been doing a lot of trainings online. Um, we've actually got some trainings that are uh, in February and coming up in March um, that we've got uh, that we can throw up on the screen here and uh, talk about some of those. So um, there's a lot of cool uh, different trainings available. If you're interested, um, email your QSE rep, me. 
Brian, whatever, we can get you signed up. Yep. Um, also, you know, if you've got a group of people, uh, you know, maybe at, at your company that want to learn, we can also do private sessions uh, available. So there's a lot of cool stuff that's coming out and that's constantly being updated and changed. Uh, every month you guys are starting to do new, new and different ones. So, yeah, so we've been adding, we've been doing these for oh, the past couple months at least. And um, yeah, we keep adding new classes every month. We change up which ones we're doing. Uh, a couple like this month we brought back because there's just so much demand for them. Um, so these are all small group setting. We do them at uh, 9 a.m. Central on Tuesday and thir- every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and we've had amazing turnout for these. Uh, we've actually filled almost every single session. Um, but we, we were trying to address having a UCI class, a scripting class, a audio class and a design class every month. So if you look at all the different topics we have for each month, we, we get into all those different areas. So it's not just all, you know, audio processing or it's not just all control. We really try and, um, change up what we're doing. So, you know, this month we've got, um, intermediate UCI design, which is really great, like teaching people how to build UCIs without having to get into scripting and stuff. Um, We have some some higher level scripting on HTTP integration and stuff. Um, And uh, we've also got some really good uh, deep dive on AEC and everything, Um, as well as, what was the last one? Um, uh, Designing for Teams Room. So how how do we integrate Teams Room and all that stuff? So We've got a lot of that. We've got some exciting ones coming up in the spring. Um, we're doing one on how you build uh, what are called web hooks. So how do I get QSIS to send a message to a Microsoft Teams channel and do that, um, which is really fun and cool and really crazy stuff we can do all with that. Um, we got classes on how to bring multi-channel audio, you know, like cinema grade audio into your installs. Um, just all, all sorts of different topics we've got coming up. Um, as well as any one of the previous classes we'll do for individuals. So just because we have uh, public classes of those scheduled on the website, we've got every class we've done. Um, and so if that's something that, you know, interests you guys, you want to get a couple people together and uh, we'll host a private session. We'll do it whenever, you know, works for people's schedule. So we're really flexible about it. Uh, we've been doing this a ton and, you know, they're nice, short little one hour classes and, you get to uh, quiz Dan and I afterwards on all your QSIS questions. Yeah, we've gotten a lot of feedback. Uh, you know, a lot of the people in the territory that have been attending them are, uh, you know, are are quite pleased. You know, again, they aren't taking up a ton of time, but they really like the the content and that kind of that small class factor to be able to ask a lot more questions and have the interaction, which is which is awesome during this, uh, you know, hard times of everyone being isolated. Um, also, don't forget about the, you know, the QSC training website, you know, for anyone that's just getting into QSIS, there's level one certification. There's always new classes that are coming out um, on there for the certifications. Um, so check those out, um, which is which is good also. Yeah, we've added the uh, quantum series on there that is advanced level technical topics. Um, and we... Uh, because of everything going on, we've actually changed the requirement for it to just be level one. So you don't need level two to get quantum done now. Um, it's available to anybody online. And it's, it's if you want to do some really deep dives into some advanced topics, that's that's your place to go. I just started yeah, those, my quantum training. So, you know, we'll, nice. we'll see how I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the nice well, thing is, too, is there it's training, right? It's training yeah. about topics in AV. And then, you know, obviously we're going to reference our gear in there a little bit, but it's it, it's industry training, right? And then we talk about the nuances of our stuff. That's, that's what we really want that series to be, so. Yep. And anyone that's watching from our territory, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy as well to go over some stuff, you know, how, as how QSC especially integrates with some of the other lines that we carry. Um, so definitely feel free to reach out on, on that as well, and we can set something up. Cool. Well, uh, looks like we're kind of coming towards the end of our time here. I just wanted to say thanks again for joining us uh, on our inaugural uh, What the Tech Wednesday. So we are aiming to be doing these uh, a couple times a month uh, on Wednesdays, uh, you know, so uh, we will probably have you on at a later date again to kind of dive in as as things are always changing with QSE, which is awesome. 
don't uh, don't die on the vine. You know, keep on inventing and keep on uh, pushing the limits with all the the QSYS systems products. So that's awesome. So I appreciate you guys taking the time uh, to join us today, and uh, I hope people learned something and it was good to interact. Um, you know, hopefully, uh, anyone that wasn't able to join us live, if you've got questions, uh, you can email us at audiobiz, um, and we're more than happy to either direct you, answer the questions, whatever we can do. So, thanks again, guys. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you. And we are going to close out with a, a short video, uh, kind of tying back to talking about Reflect. So that's how we are going to close today. So if you want to learn more about uh, Reflect, uh, stay tuned for the, the rest of the stream.